So what I want to offer you is um, I'm going to really rely heavily on my own domain expertise, which is anth anthropology. And I want to give you some empirical material from the book that I just finished with Sadara Suri as a, a, something to hold on to for thinking through what are both the possibilities but also the limits of what we can do with artificial intelligence. And I want to offer a very concrete case, which is thinking about work. So we can all relate to this statement, I, I'm imagining. And anybody have a perfect boss in the house? Just want to check. My boss is here, so yes, she is amazing. Um, but if no boss is perfect, and this really resonates, neither is code. And this is paraphrasing from one of the workers that we interviewed for the research for this book. And so what I want to ask you to think about for the conversation is what happens when code is unintentionally made the boss? What are the implications, the very practical impact and um, the ways we have to grapple with when technologies fail us? Rather than thinking eventually they do improve, which they do, but while they're course correcting and while there are failure rates, what happens? Because that's what I have to offer you today is what's the, the impact when things go wrong? And Sid and I talk about this as the paradox of automation's last mile. There are several versions of this, but use this as a way of framing up how to think about this question, that we know that as machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence are definitely able to replace or automate some forms of work, what they do along the way, and that's, again, what I want to share with you, is that they create new types of work. And in fact, these types of work are deeply dependent on people. Now, it may be that their human expertise gets booted out of the way once we've worked out how to get them out of the way. But the thing I want you to focus on is that for a stretch of time, for that paradox of that moment between when we've nailed it with AI and when we're still figuring it out, there are people at work. What does that feel like? And what are the consequences of that? So what are today's last mile jobs? Today, it's about cleaning and structuring training data for artificial intelligence, or effectively giving machine learning good materials to, to learn with. That looks like data entry. That looks like location verification, which is a kind of data entry. Data labeling, because many of the times when we're producing data online, we're, we're not very good about it. We just throw things up there. And it takes people to come along and label and annotate how to make sense of certain kinds of data so that it's a really good structured data set for machine learning. And then I'm going to use content review and hold on to that category as something that trains artificial intelligence to take over and to be able to look at content and automatically decide what to do with it. But there's this second stream of work that's being produced that I don't think many of us track. And it's the world of business that's often serving other businesses that specifically wants to keep a person in the loop because they're incredibly good at making snap judgments. And they're able to do things that artificial intelligence and the code we have just cannot do efficiently or effectively. So they're placed to be able to provide a moment of things like sales leads generation. Again, kind of boring, but really good business. Content moderation, going to come back to that. Things like translating and captioning video in multiple languages. Again, we can imagine a day when AI might be able to take over that functionality. We have a generation, maybe two, maybe three, maybe five, depending on what language we're talking about, where people will be doing that work. So you could say right now, many of us can imagine um, forms of this work, and I'm going to call it online to offline <laughs> platform services, where you can use an app and you can call up a person and an application programming interface in the internet. So a little sprinkle of which is not very sophisticated machine learning. It's definitely not really AI. But it's delivering a person to offer a service that's been called up in somewhat automated ways. Algorithmically, it's organizing a service for you. There's this other world of work that seriously, two years ago when I talked about content moderation, how many, how many of you would have known that could be a person? 
I mean, most of us had no idea that people actually did content moderation. That's just at the surface of most people's awareness as a kind of work that people do when they're stepping into the maw of that paradox of automation's last mile. Well, it turns out that's the tip of the iceberg. There's actually scores of businesses that have spun up that are there to deliver what's called online to online information services. That's the data labeling, the data handling, managing the flood of all the information we're producing constantly, whether we know it or not, when we're interacting with each other online and doing anything that produces a record that gets captured by a company and they want to figure out how to squeeze some value out of it, it turns out turning it over to folks who can look at that material, sometimes contextualize it with other data sets, is a booming business. And it's not a bad business. And importantly, I'm not saying these are bad or good jobs. What I'm saying is these are not niche jobs. These are literally new ways of organizing work that dismantle full-time employment. It's a mechanism that is built to say, let's be task-based, let's be project-based. And in doing that, it has literally sliced up everything from health care services to customer service to legal services to content moderation to scores of other kinds of information service work that are fairly mundane. It's knowledge work. It's office work. But importantly, it's not going away. AI actually can't effectively replace people for this kind of cognitive information service work and in fact often benefits from keeping people in the loop for those moments when AI freezes up. So the, the, the challenge is, yes, eventually AI will solve one kind of problem and the goalpost keeps moving. We keep demanding more, expecting more of artificial intelligence. That's the challenge, is that we will solve some problems and we humans will keep asking it to do more. And as we do that, we are generating work, but not full-time employment. We're generating task-based, project-driven work, precisely because the nature of what we're asking people to do is constantly changing. It's not a career trajectory. It's organizing around a project or task to be solved by ML and AI. That's radically different than how we approach the way we think about employment, and our argument is that that's leading to what we call ghost work conditions. And what makes these jobs that are otherwise entirely habitable, they could be decent work, what makes them ghost work is that they elide, they hide, and often devalue the value of the person in the loop in the moment. Because right now we have not built our way of orienting to labor and valuing people for their contributions around projects and tasks, contract work that's done often by the piece globally. So let me make this concrete for anybody in the room who's not familiar with what's called human computation and how most of machine learning moves forward is having some sort of training data set that's really good at training the algorithms that'll model what kind of decision you might want to make. It's the exact same mechanism that's going to deliver you a ride to the airport, your food to the door, and perhaps a text service response when you're online and need some help with something. It's businesses on one side demanding a task be filled. Think demands, the supply demand here. They're putting it on a platform that's literally just a website with a good application programming interface mix and the internet. And they're calling people to those platforms, literally an open call that says, hey, do you have some time? Do you want to do a project or a task? Sign up. That would be great. You know, we'll, we'll throw some algorithmic management at it, to use Alex Rosenblatt's term, and then we'll get going. And that person answering that call is the labor supply. This is how task-based, project-driven work can be, at least in part, sourced, managed, scheduled, shipped, and billed through this combination of fairly um, unsophisticated software in the internet. That's what makes this mechanism so powerful. And in many ways, it's what can push a lot of uh, development around uh, artificial intelligence. But importantly, the value proposition here isn't wholesale, let's replace the human. 
It's right now what we need to do is blend people and code. What we need is what is still distinctly human, and I would, I would um, uh, f in a very friendly way, argue with Pedro that what distinguishes humans is our capacity to spontaneously react with no priors. If you have no data set and you need to respond, humans are still by far knocking it out of the park. And most importantly, when we get it wrong, we actually know how to reply with a, oh, I'm sorry. And it's still, human, it's still meaningful to hear that from another human. So as long as that still means something to us, to have empathy from another person, we can imagine we'll still have people in the loop. So it's not just this blend of one person, though, that's important. It's actually not just a single set of people. It's operating with this sense of shared abundance. You actually have to have a lot of people. Because the value proposition isn't one person answering this call for this one task. It is literally that sense of self-assurance you feel as a consumer or a business. When you open it up an app, and I'm going to imagine that all of you can relate to this example, you open up an app and you see many cars floating around your address, and you have to get to the airport because you're late. And you see those many cars and you think, five minutes away, I can get a car, I can close my app, and I can say goodbye to my kid. Versus if you opened up the app and you saw two cars and one might be there in 20 minutes, how do you feel? Which of those two companies are you going to pick? The way these labor markets have blown up and become a source of consumer demand is that they offer this shared abundance. Not one person serving you, but many people who could answer your call. It's incredibly powerful and arguably we've never been good at valuing people being available to us. So one of the challenges here is that we end up with ghost work conditions precisely when we devalue the humans who are doing this work and companies sell it like it's the magic of AI. Or we forget that we actually have an abundance of people available to us. We call this algorithmic cruelty in the book, and it's a bit of a provocative phrasing. It, we draw and, and actually um, uh, stretch a bit uh, this term that came from Eric Meyer in 2014. And we define it as those moments of thoughtless processing of human effort. Algorithms can't process that somebody has tried. And so if you're trying and you fail, there's nothing there to register that you might need assistance. That's true for consumers, but imagine if that's your experience at work. So on-demand workers understand more than most what it feels like to live under the algorithmic cruelty that assumes that everything's running smoothly and that there's nothing there that is accounting for failure rate that just comes with AI. In fact, a little side joke, my boss, uh, one of my bosses loves to joke that we'll get the AI right when we get the AV right. If you've ever gone to try and print something, if you have a 100% positive, it always works experience, you're ahead of everyone <laughs> because code fails. It can't, it's not perfect. So that means that there are these hidden costs that come with the failure rate that just accompanies any software. One is this sense of hypervigilance that workers relayed to us, where they had to constantly, constantly be looking for projects and tasks. And it's often presented, spun up as flexibility. This is great, you can come in and out of this program. But if the engineers who are building these labor, program, labor platforms did not think people are going to need a break or to build in something that allows for the opportunity for somebody to claim something and say, I'd like to come back to that in 20 minutes. You literally have to assume that you have to be on the platform all the time to take advantage of what projects might be available. That's a design decision. That's algorithmically managing a specific design decision. Isolation is not inherent in these systems either, but by design, without much thinking of the stakeholder doing their work, these platforms have been built to effectively say, we don't want workers talking. Talk is a waste of time. And so in fact, workers move off platform and form deep collaborations and networks with each other just to deal with the fact that the
the platforms themselves didn't build in the value of interacting with coworkers. And then one other hidden cost is wage theft. And I don't use that lightly, and often it's not intentional, not companies trying to steal money, the wages from workers who complete work. But let me give you an example that's in the book where workers who lose their credentials because there's some sort of error in authenticating them are literally locked out of their workplace. And in some cases, if their accounts are suspended because the company can no longer verify who this person on the other side of the planet might be who's signed up for an account to do work, in those cases, if that company like Amazon Mechanical Turk is also your payment source, they literally have no way to, re to claim their last paycheck. And it's that catch-22. If you've ever been in a bad customer service phone tree automated system and you just start madly hitting zero because you want to talk to a person, it's that. It's not anticipating that that will happen and that this is a workplace where you need recourse. So these ghost work conditions are arguably a collision of many things, but it's not just the technologies failing. It's also thinking about how we've built all of our social safety net, all of the social contract around how we protect and recognize securing good work conditions for work. We built them in the United States and ended the project in about 1940, 1946, depending on who you're talking to. So most of our systems to be able to shore up and, and secure work came with an assembly line. They didn't imagine pro project-based work. They imagined nine to five shift work. And in fact, they fought for nine to five shift work to end the tyranny of not being able to finish your day. So recognizing most of what we have in place was not built for this world of work is key. That's part of what's contributing to the challenges. It was also not considering how, from the 1960s onward, companies saw a lot of value for a range of reasons that we hopefully will talk about in using temp, using temp services because they were cheap. And it was the beginning of recognizing that when you're information service driven, when you're service driven more broadly, you're often trying to chase the tastes of consumers. You're constantly trying to change what do you have to offer. And it turns out temp services are a great way to be able to constantly be switching up what you offer. Again, there are other parts of that conversation we, we should have about reducing costs and in some ways ignoring the value of workers who are there in front of you. And it becomes painfully clear by you know, the end of this moment of the 2000s when we shift to the globalization of taking advantage of labor arbitrage as a business model that we are really relying on contract work because it's cheap. And we haven't really revisited that conversation. What does it mean if that is the bulk of our employment? What is the new social contract we want to have around how to make work sustainable and economical? Today, I would say that machine learning techniques, are, they're riding on that history. It's not that the histories replace each other, but rather they collide and carry with each other. So these senses of contract work is good, it's cheap, it's usually the people who shouldn't be paid much because clearly they're replaceable. That logic is now making it harder for us to see, gosh, we're actually now completely dependent on what's distinctly human. And we're actually dependent on an aggregated shared abundance, a group of people, not one person. We don't know how to value that. So it's erasing the value of the human in the loop, but arguably this is the continuation of a history of not knowing how to value a human in the loop in a moment of service. So reality check here is that AI, and I'm quoting Melanie Mitchell, one of my um, favorite computer scientists on this topic, that we constantly underestimate the complexity of general human level intelligence. It's that underestimation that is part of why we have high failure rates. We often don't understand what's complicated about human decision making. So the good news is that this is an endless source of project-based task-driven work for people. This is actually good news because I actually believe fundamentally this is about being able to reorient our lives so that we can have work organized around our lives 
rather than our lives organized around work. Because we will be in the position of deciding what are the projects that we can contribute to. If we build out a social safety net and a social contract that allows that, for example. So unfortunately, the techniques, and this is where I'm going to get a little meta, because I am at Microsoft Research and I do study my co-author, Sid, Sid, Sid Suri, as much as I work with him, is that for the most part, tech companies' approaches to how would I build a system, it's rooted in some fairly old research techniques. It's about cleaning and mining data sets that are pre-existing. And notice we're just saying data sets. Note the flat files behind this gentleman. Scraping the web is just scraping the web. That's all information. We're buying structured data. I can get it from your credit agency. Why not? I can get it from your keyboard, from your mouse movements. Why not? By the 2000s onward, doing technology development looks much more like a social enterprise. We are interacting with society. This is the open world um, that we often talk about in technology studies. That means that I'm A-B testing in real time. It means that I'm creating these enhanced data sets, so I'm collecting information from whatever you might type on your, on your keyboard to what I might be able to get from another data set, say your search queries, and then I'm looking to bring those together to understand not just you, but your group. And so it's that, that approach that is, in many ways, ongoing with communities that is the place where bringing in people to be able to make sense of that information can be incredibly valuable. But arguably, as a society, we haven't quite agreed yet, because it happened very quickly. We haven't agreed at what point is it OK for a tech company to do this while we're having our social exchanges online. So arguably, what's changed for computer science and engineers is that they're asking these deeply social and behavioral questions to develop predictive systems that can be the AI that serves us. But it requires a deep understanding of what people are doing, not just seeing what they do, but understanding why. And people are still very good at offering some, some suggestions, some hypotheses on that. It means we're creating new methods like human computation for that job, but we haven't really figured out what are the ethics of those practices. As engineers, what are our ethical practices? And then we're constantly studying social data, but in many ways, we're also interacting with society. So when we build systems, we're having to iterate. That's really new for CS engineering folks. They're used to building software that sits up on a shelf in a shrink wrap box. That's very different. So arguably, the future of work, and I would say the future of AI, really depends on seeing and managing it as a work site that have many people participating in producing it. And then, in fact, those people don't go away. They become even more valuable. And it's not just the individuals who are valuable. But this commons, this image is from the Boston Commons, that it is literally valuing people as a commons available to each other, to businesses, to consumers, but most importantly, to themselves and others as citizens producing this world that we can learn from if we tend it properly. So thank you.